Hi everybody, I'm Zillow Litz and welcome. Today we're going to take a deep dive first look at Storming the Gap, the first volume in the World at War 85 series from Lock and Load Publishing. Now volume 2 in this series, Blood and Fury, is on the very near horizon, but before taking a look at that game, I wanted to go back to the origin of the series and kind of give an overview of what the series is all about. Now the heart of this game is hypothetical World War 3 combat set in Europe in 1985. We've got East German, West German forces, Soviet forces, and US forces. This is a platoon level game system, and inside this volume we have 21 scenarios, 8 maps, over 600 counters, and a battle generator included. Let's jump in and take a look at the components, talk a little bit about some of the mechanics, and offer some impressions on gameplay. Now, just again, a background here, we've got in this game, we've got East German and Soviet forces attacking West German and US forces, platoon level combat set in a hypothetical Cold War goes hot, 1985 in Germany. So we'll dump with that kind of uh, background information, let's jump in now and get started and take a look at our overall characteristics. We have a vassal compatibility of five. I really can't state anything to that. I haven't looked at the vassal mod for this at all, but I would like to talk a little bit about the complexity. Um, it states here a 5 out of 10. I feel like that might be a little light, although I do want to spend some time talking about the rules now because I just finished. I've got one last section to read in the rules, but I'm 95% of the way through them. Um, I feel like a 5.5 or maybe a 6 is a little more justified, but certainly a 5 isn't that far off. It's uh, despite the amount of rules, um, uh, well, we'll talk about when we get inside, but that feels about right. Solitaire playability is a 6. Now, subsequent to this volume coming out, or perhaps it, just a separate item, there is a solo mod for this game, a solo expansion pack or a system you can buy for this game. It's not in this box, so if you're playing solo, you're going to be playing both sides if you just have this part here. Um, 6 out of 10, I actually might even go a little bit higher because I think the way the formation cards trigger activity and the ebb and flow of the game, I think it's going to work really well for playing both sides. So I might actually be inclined to go up as much even as a 7 for this. A little bit hard to say again until we dig in and play the game, but I do feel like it's going to be very, very solitaire friendly and it'd be uh, an easy experience to turn into a solitaire experience. We have one to two players, which again feels about right. And then playing time is one to two hours, although to me it feels like the larger scenarios, uh, there are 21 scenarios, we'll take a look at a few of them. I think those larger scenarios are going to be longer than two hours, but certainly the, the mid-size or shorter scenarios, one to two hours feels about right. Now, let's open this beast up. First of all, this is a big box. Um, we've got 13 inches on the vertical, like 10 and a half, I think, on the horizontal here, and then three high and as seems to be the way with lock and load publications it is jam-packed full to just maybe a half inch or so of the top of stuff let's start with the rules here now this is rule set version 2.0 and I know that blood and fury is going to ship with rule set version 2.2 essentially the same thing. I think there's just kind of clarifications and some slight modifications made in version 2.2. But, um, you know, so it might be worth picking up, picking up the version 2.2 rule set. Maybe eventually this will be updated with it. I'm not sure, but version 2.0 is the, the one that came with me. Certainly you're not that far off if you're looking at version uh, rule, rule set here, uh, 2.0 as opposed to 2.2. Now, 140 pages. <laughs> Which makes me think like, what are you talking about? A five complexity. But I want to talk a little bit about that. First of all, in the back here, uh, you've got some kind of terrain effects and some other things that are kind of, um, this is a starter kit scenario that I think you can set up with the units or the, in the game. I know there used to be a starter kit on its own. I don't think the intent is to cut these out because they're kind of on both sides here. So I think it's more to show what that starter kit was and then allow you to kind of recreate that experience with this package here. So those are, those are there. Then in the back here, we have a starter kit scenario. Here's that extra scenario. That's that starter kit scenario. Um, and we go back to page 119 here, 121. So already we've chopped up some of the rules here and we're down into this rather extensive index, which is actually really helpful. As I've been reading the rules, I've been using this. So that's 15 pages right there. So now we're down to 104, so we're getting shorter. And we've got some acknowledgements, designer notes, where we can hear a glossary of terms. And now we're down to 100. Notes, scenario resources are where we really kind of get there, but that's really not rule stuff as well. And then scenario rules and order of battle, probably where the rules end. So we've got 97 pages of rules. And you might say, wow, that's a lot of rules. But hold your horses here, because it's not that much. I, I think it's fair to say that I've read 
30 page rule books or 25 page rule books that have as much text as this 100 page rule book does okay because the text is really nice and large we've got two columns it's really well laid out there are graphics examples um, illustrations uh, highlighted areas it's so well organized i i i think i've read through this rule book it probably took me about three, four hours maybe to read through the whole thing over a couple of nights, kind of going through it and kind of really trying to understand the gameplay. So I'm not trying to just read through it as a first pass, really trying to, when I have a question, I go look stuff up. This might be, it's certainly one of the best rule books I've read. Now the real test comes when you play it. I have loved the clarity, the expl ex uh, kind of explanations. Whenever I've been reading something, a question usually pops up in my head and the answer is almost immediately in either that paragraph or the next paragraph I get there. I feel like there's been a lot of thought to kind of uh, clarifying things, creating examples, uh, creating a kind of just a, a, a lot of additional helpful information. We have design notes here. You know, this yellow note is kind of informational stuff that might clear up possible you know, confusions that happen with the rules. And again, there's just graphics and information and helpful stuff and it's organized by section and it's really easy to look stuff up and everything's cross-referenced. So if you get one place, the rule kind of leads over to someplace else, it's going to point you in that direction. I have had very little, if any, d confusion looking up or finding something else when I wanted to re re kind of re reference a different rule. So I've spent, I think, almost no time looking for information to answer my question. And I think that, in essence, is the sign of a, a real good rule book. When you're trying to find something and you have a question about it, you can go to that section in the rule book really quickly and figure out where it is. And that's been happening consistently as I've gone through and learned these rules. So I love these rules. I love the rule book. I feel like it's very, very well organized. It's been fun to learn because the writing's been so clear and everything's been so well organized. So that's why I think I mean, there is still a lot here. It's modern warfare, so you've got different types of kind of armor, you've got indirect fire, you've got chemical weapons in here. There's a bunch of stuff in here. You have assault action, you've got moving fire, but missiles, you've got helicopters and stuff like that. There's a lot here. And so I thought it was going to be, I, with all of the complexity of kind of modern combat, or at least 1985 combat, I felt like it was going to be a much bigger and tougher learning experience than it was. I was very surprised at how easy and smooth the learning experience has been for this game. So I am thrilled. I was, I was, I thought it was going to be much harder. I was kind of a little bit overwhelmed and daunted with the task at first. It's been a joy to do and it's been super easy. So I wouldn't let the complexity of the rules drive you away from this experience. And so I, that's a lot longer than I usually talk about the rule book, but I feel like it's important to say because this rule book feels really, really good. So, okay, enough on the rules. Let's talk about the, let's take a look at the module rules and scenarios. 131 pages. This is where we start to get into um, a little bit more kind of, uh, kind of straightforward kind of scenario elements here. 21 scenarios, very well organized, really easy, clear setup instructions. So you've got all kind of visual guides for your information here. Um, again, it kind of sets the scene with these little campaign maps that are in here. There isn't a, a dynamic campaign element to this game, although the, we'll talk about that as we look at some of the expansions for this game. Um, various sizes, lots of different historical and hypothetical historical context. You know, you've got the mix of the West German, East German, Soviet unit, US units, lots of different types of engagements and activities and historical flavor that's added to these. So yeah, these are these are pretty cool. Different scope and size and scale, some small, some big, all kinds of different challenges. And again, with the eight different maps, so here we can see one that uses four maps. With the eight different maps that are all geomorphic, um, you can really kind of come in and build your own. And that is one section I did want to mention in the rule. There is a full uh, battle generator system, and we'll take a look at that on some of the player aids as we go through those. So you are not just limited to the 21 scenarios that you get here. You can make your own scenarios very easily, and there's a whole guide for being able to do that. And I feel like that's been, you know, as I've looked at more of the lock and load uh, publishing uh, content and games, I feel like that's been kind of a thematic point of emphasis for them is putting a ton of replayability and depth into their packages here. And I feel like this again starts to highlight their kind of design method. Like let's put a lot in here so people can really dig in and get a lot of gameplay out of what they have purchased. So big, nice, thick module rules and scenarios element there. And again, 21 scenarios with the battle generation system plus the starter kit too is in there too. So I guess that's 2022. Now let's take a look at our counters here. These are extremely beautiful. For some reason, 
And maybe other people can let me know. I'll show some close-ups to these as we go through them. For some reason, this game reminds me so much of Panzerblitz, the old Avalon Hill game. And I don't mean that from a visual standpoint at all. The visual uh, presentation of this game is light years different from that game. But just that platoon level combat with a lot of numbers and the variety of the tanks and everything like that, I feel like this is Panzerblitz brought up to modern design standards set in 1985 rather than in World War II. But that's, I'm just constantly reminded for that with the range and the way this platoon level combat works at this level with armor, kind of semi-modern combat, at least World War II in 1985 and stuff like that. But now uh, we've got seven counter sheets here. They are all printed on the front and the back. A, a, more, a very large number of units have a two-step combat system and they're really gonna take, as you're in combat, they're going to get disrupted, then a step loss, and then eliminated. So it's kind of a three degrees of hits here. Now, we'll take a look at one of these armor counters too, and I do wanna talk a little bit about some of the combat and what these numbers mean. So if we look here, for example, at this M1 Abrams tank, uh, we can see in the top left side, we've got 11, four, and five. Um, what we've got there then, the 11 is the range, the four are the amount of firepower dice that you roll, and then the five is your two hit number on a six-sided die, you need that or green. Greater. Um, the right top right hand side is the same system range firepower dice to hit number but that's your high explosive ammunition the bottom left is your armor number that's the number of defensive dice you get to roll so there's a system where you're going to roll your offensive dice see how many hits you get and then the defender rolls its defensive dice and that's how many hits it negates now there's terrain modifiers and a lot of other die roll modifiers and dice modifiers that can happen in here too so that's a very kind of a, a simplification of what's going to happen but basically one defensive die successful roll negates one offensive hit. Whatever's left over gets through to the unit. So this bottom left is you're going to roll four defensive dice and you need a five or greater to stave, uh, to make a saving roll on one of those incoming hits. The middle is the movement number, which would be a six. The bottom right is our assault number. So two dice and you need a four or greater to hit. You know, four being a 50% chance you're going to hit a little bit higher range because you're at close range and it is bloody assault. So, you know, as you look at this kind of very complicated unit, um, it can look overwhelming, but then when you hear the explanation for it, you're like, oh, well, that's not bad. Now, there are other things here. We can see, for example, an orange uh, marker. That means it's either composite or reactive armor and that the little triangle there. And the orange dice, uh, the kind of the die rolls for those signify some different things that you're going to have to be aware of. There's some different colors like blue and green and things like that that signify different things. But overall, I'm very impressed with how it's taken a complex modern, or, I mean, 1985 war game and brought so much information to the counters in a way that just feels really organized. When I looked at it at first, I was like, wow, that's a lot of numbers on that unit. But then when you realize what they signify, it's like, oh, that's actually not that hard at all. Top left is um, yeah, armor piercing, top right is high explosive, bottom left is your defense, bottom middle is your movement, bottom right is your assault, done, that's it, really easy. So it's, you know, it's not, it, it's, Again, I would go back to the idea, I wouldn't let the complexity of the game keep you away from the game. I think the rules are so well written and so well thought out, and again, in their second iteration, that um, it surprised me how uh, straightforward this game has been to, to learn here. Such a great variety of units. We're looking there, of course, of, at US units. The gray units here are the West German units. Again, we use NATO symbols for the infantry. Same type of system, too. So top left, armor piercing, you know, top right is high explosive. Then this is a soft target, so it's got an S for infantry. So all kind of the same system. And now we get into the bottom, here we get our Soviet units. We can see some leaders here too. There is a leader system for the game that influences unit performance as well. And we slide over here into um, the Soviet units, lots of Soviet units here. And now we get, um, I believe the dark blue here are East German units. So we kind of float over and lots of different stuff. I mean, there's over 600 counters in the game. So really, again, when you kind of think about that battle generation system and the fact that you've got eight maps and you, know, you can really go large scale on some of these scenarios and kind of make up a lot of different uh, imaginary situations that you could uh, want to play out. I mean, there's really, I think, a lot of design your own scenario opportunities with this. Now, as we get into uh, number five here, we finish up the East German units and we get some of the gameplay markers, things like smoke, low missile ammo, no missile ammo, reloading missiles. We get fords and bridges, electronic warfare is modeled in the game. There's a, a weather system. And then we have some here is fire for effect for artillery, indirect and uh, direct, well, indirect artillery. We get fire potential. There's rubble potential cleared. Uh, we have mines. So again, we see quite a bit of the complexity of the system. There are a good number of mechanics here, which again, 
you need them. You got your simulating modern combat, so you kind of need things. It's just going to be more complex than than World War II, World War One, or going backwards in time. Um, helicopters in here, well, helicopters can be kind of nap of the earth. They can be flying, they can be hovering, or they can be landed. So there's uh, rules that kind of use, and the markers are used here for landed and nap of the earth. But if we were to look back on the, the helicopter counter, you flip it over to represent when it's hovering, and you flip it the other side when it's flying. So that's how you get the four status for the different aircraft as well. And again, all these double-sided with some variety on the back too. And even units that are single-sided are printed on both sides. It's just, I think a lot of thought's been put through to make the, the gameplay experience flow smoothly. Um, a lot of markers here. These are, you know, operations executed. We've got disrupted again, that first state of damage. And then if armored units are wiped out, you replace them with a Rex um, counter. There is a command system with headquarters, as we'll see as we look at some of the, well, there we can see some of the headquarter cards back, the units back here. If we look here, West German headquarter right here, there is a command and control system in place for this uh, with ranges for different formations. We'll take a look at that as we look at the, the formation cards when we get to that. So yeah, lots of markers in here uh, and everything. So seven big counter sheets. Okay, now this is the part that, I, again, the idea that if you can make up, I feel like for Lock and Load when they make a game, it's like if there must be people that just sit there and just like make up ideas for playing aids and nobody ever says no. Everybody just says, yeah, yeah, make it. Because look at this. This is so many player aids. <laughs> and I'm not making, I'm not saying this is a bad thing. It's a good thing, right? Because it's just so helpful to have all this stuff so you don't have to go poking around in the rules for it or poking around in charts and tables for it. It's all just like right here. Now, to be fair, a good chunk of these are what are called the uh, national unit charts. And basically this is um, everything you want to know about a unit. It's got the cost for it if you're going to be generating it in a scenario and things like that. It's got any particular rules and special functions here by code on the right hand side. And these are all signified what they are down here with re references right to the specific rule that you want to look at if you're not sure what that is. So we've got a visual representation of both sides of the counter, what type it is, all the information that you could ask about a particular unit is right here. And there are, these are double-sided. There are two for each nation. So this is one of the two that we'd be looking at for the West German units. So really just a handy system to have nearby as you're playing the games. Now, I will say too, in the expansion pack that we'll look at in another first look coming up soon, there are unit data cards too that take a lot of this key information for a unit um, and put it in a data card formation that you can keep nearby that would, would take up less space and you'd only need the ones there for the ones that you're using in the game. But still, this is really handy, especially if you're kind of generating your own uh, scenarios and things like that. And again, we have uh, four sided, so two cards, four sides here. This is the East German one. We can look through these against Soviet. I'm not gonna show these all, but you, you get the idea. They're just kind of the same system for every unit that's uh, with each of the four major combatants in the game here. So that's a good chunk of our player aids there. Now let's go down to there's, I think there's three here that I kind of categorize as kind of things that are going to be beside the map to help you with kind of keeping track of certain gameplay states. So here we have our turn re record track. There's a weather system built into the game. Weather can change as a squall box or a mud box, which kind of some other weather effects there. And here's where you track any NATO and your allies off board artillery tracks. So we've got different types of artillery, including chemical weapons as well. And then this is the one for the Soviets here. We're going to take a look at the cards momentarily because this is a card activated game by formation. So we'll talk about that as we look at this. And again, I think the system is gonna work really well, solitaire for playing both sides. This is your draw deck and this is your discard deck. So again, a second player aid that's gonna kind of stay beside the game state here to help you keep track of offboard artillery, uh, time record track, and then the card deck there. And then lastly, this is kind of the, um, the, the holding boxes for different units. There are three different states. If you have suppressed headquarters, they have to go back up here to be ready to be redeployed. Um, and this is support weapons you can put up here that can be deployed on units mid-play. And then we have, of course, casualties down here for units that have been knocked out of action and things. And again, that one's one-sided, as are these other two, because they're always going to be face up on your game board there. Alrighty. So now, as we look at this one, there are a few player aids here I call just like, they're kind of like chocolate player aids, like sweets. They're just really helpful, really well designed, and extraordinarily 
it, packed with information in a high graphical format. So this is one for the unit and card reference. So when I was talking about the unit over there and what all of the different things meant for it, um, you know, here's an explanation of that. So if you forget something when you're playing, you can look at it here. And again, there are a number of situations where there's some, again, it's modern combat. So you have some kind of a green circle in the movement here. What does that mean? A blue circle in the movement. Here's a blue and green one. What does that mean? And this explains all those things to trigger your memory. So probably I think these are more helpful as you are learning the game. We also have a triangle system. Um, there are four different triangles represented that represent unique characteristics of these units. The red is recon, gray means it can be indirect fire. This orange is composite or reactive armor. And then this black here is signifies that it's, a, a, um, I believe it's a missile unit that has to have a minimum range of three um, to, in order to be able to fire those missiles. So lots of just really kind of helpful stuff in here for that. And then we have uh, the marker reference, what all the different markers mean in case you've got that. So again, just, this is totally unnecessary. The game doesn't need this. I just feel like someone said, we should have a you know player's aid for all the different units and stuff. And someone says, yeah, okay, make it. And then they do something like this and add it to the game. So impressive. This is a more in-depth look at those special ability triangle references. And again, I thought, wow, is this going to get overwhelming? But it's actually really easy to learn. Oh, there's one more yellow, which is the elite units here. So again, we get some uh, more there. His indirect fire abbreviations, movement and fire summary chart. So it kind of um, organizes in chart fashion the rules for move and fire because you know there are different restrictions and penalties. When you move a certain distance, you're going to reduce a certain amount of fire your fire uh, power dice. So it kind of explains that in, in kind of a graphical format. Now we get more stuff. This is your formation card inventory. So if you want to kind of track where the cards are for the formations, we'll look at those shortly here. There is an event system. It's double layered. So you have an event that could subsequently trigger a friction event. So these are kind of to add a little bit of color and unpredictability to the battle. And that's going to get triggered by drawing the card in the gameplay deck. So as you're going to be going through your turn, you're going to be drawing these cards cards that are going to tell you what unit, what formations get activated. You could draw this battlefield event table, which you roll on here. It will give you kind of a color event that could impact gameplay. It might also tell you to go to this rarer one, which is the friction table, and you're going to get different stuff there. So a really neat way to simply add uh, a bit of color and unpredictability and kind of story to the games as you play. Now, here is the battle generator card. So it's giving you an idea if you want small scenarios, just some kind of graphical guidance for how you might structure your own scenario, victory conditions, turn length and objectives if you want to change those around, how many uh, unit points you want. So if you want a Soviet pact attacking, you're gonna have a small scenario, one map, nine turns, you want to spend 600 unit points to build your NATO force and 850 points to build your Soviet force. So just really easy to kind of um, build up your own little scenario, some guidance in there too. Weather change chart for all the different ways that the weather can change in that system there. This was cool. I don't think I've seen this in another game yet. It's every die roll in the series. <laughs> And with rule references as to where you go to look up more information on that. So if you ever have to roll a die and you're not sure what's supposed to happen. Now, um, it does say here, consult the rules for exceptions and modifiers, but just a really kind of neat uh, little player aid. I don't know how much I'll use this one, but I'm kind of curious to see as we get into play gameplay here, will it be something that gets used? But it's just nice to have to be able to look there and say, okay, here is our sequence of play deck. It looks rather complicated, but most of these steps here um, are going to be... So here is like kind of your unit action. These are your formation impulses, the things that you can do in that. So when you draw a formation card, you work through these steps. But a lot of these are like missile reload, check command status, refresh. Those are just like super fast things. The heart of the game really, I feel like, is you're drawing a formation card and then you do stuff with that formation on the map there. Um, and there are a number of options that you can do that. Move, direct fire, move and fire, onboard indirect fire, assault, kinds of things like that. Um, direct fire modifiers, so some explanations for that. And again, despite the, the, the looks of the complexity, I am com been completely surprised at how clear the rules are, how well organized they are. And again, I'll take complexity and clarity any time in a game. I would much rather have that than simplicity and ambiguity. So a nice complex rule set that is excellently explained and has a lot of clarity to it is just a joy. I really like that type of learning and playing experience. Another one of these kind of player aids that you're like, they just added it in, right? Let's just make a player aid. This is, um, all, these are all the line of sight rules. 
And this is often one thing that I struggle with, with uh, tactical level games at this level, like platoon and height and terrain and stuff like that. I read through this like one and a half times. I read a couple of them twice just to make sure I got them. I'm like, gosh, that makes so much sense. That's just not very hard at all. And especially because there's a lot of explanation here. And then on the back side of this, you get this whole example. It's a map that's written out here with all different examples of all the different situations that can happen with explanations as to whether it's blocked. So you can kind of quiz yourself here, whether it's blocked and clear and why it is and things like that. And then more examples over here uh, as to what the rules are for that. So really handy uh, line of sight, which is again, I think until you get up to speed in the game, that's always something that's there. We are finally almost done with our player aids. It's a player aid companion here. The last thing, three things we have are just the train effects charts. So we have uh, you know these these types of train here with their explanations in here with movement paw, craw, uh, costs and specific features. And then uh, another two-sided one here that's got the different types of terrain and different aspects of it. What is really cool here too that I've found helpful as learning the line of sight rules here is that um, it gives you, for each piece of terrain, it gives you the, the terrain height that it is, so the obstacle height that's there, that it's there, so hill on hills on a woods is an obstacle height of three, and then it gives you the height characteristics of the units that are in there depending upon what height. So if you have a helicopter hovering over a hill in woods, you don't have to figure that out. You can just look and say, okay, oh, that's a four, got it. Okay, flying, a five, I got it. So then you can go back to those line of sight rules and just kind of figure out what the line of sight is. So I found this really helpful as I was kind of playing with some ideas and question marks, looking at the map and kind of just doing some things to see if I'd understood the line of sight rules. That was really, really helpful. So yeah, I think a very extensive, as usual with Lock and Low Public, a very extensive set of playing aids. Now we get a mumbo pile of cards. These are all the cards. And I want to talk a little bit about how these work, because basically you're going to be building up a deck. You might have, I don't know, four or five formations, say, in a particular scenario, uh, based on their headquarters, and you're going to pull out the formation cards, and they're going to go in a deck. You're gonna take the enemy's formation cards that are gonna go in a deck like that, and you're gonna basically build up a playing deck, and you're gonna flip these over, and then you turn over the first card, and this Lima 3rd 11th ACR uh, unit platoon is gonna go first, and they're going to be activated. So you're going to take them and you're going to go through all of their actions. Then you're going to flip over another card and that's what's going to go. And as we shall see, as we kind of look through these, uh, there's a number. Here's the one for battlefield event and friction. So that would be included in that deck. When you flip that over, you roll on that event table to see what kind of uh, battlefield event that you get. There's other ones here for objectives. I confess I'm not quite sure yet how those work. And the numbers in here are really easy to get too. Um, each formation card has three numbers. This is basic, it's kind of morale and it's command, if you would. So two-sided die, you're rolling this or less. Then the five and the four here, and that's something I've seen in other lock and load publishing games, and you know, it's in a number of games too, so it's not necessarily that novel and new. Uh, then we have a five and a four. This is if the uh, headquarters is undisrupted. This is if the headquarters is disrupted. That's gonna reduce it like that. Disrupted or suppressed, one of the two. So it gets less of a command range if you get there. And again, as you get an idea for the scope of it, up oh, here's an electronic warfare card. So that's an event that can happen. That would be pulled into certain scenarios. And then the cool thing here is that you get end operation cards. Uh, most decks will have two of these or three of these in it. And then when you pull the second end operations card, that ends that turn, which means that you still might have some formations that didn't activate in that turn and they're gonna get left over, but those go above the end operations cards in the next shuffling of the deck. So you're gonna be sure that a unit won't skip two turns. But again, it creates that, okay, what card is coming up? How am I gonna use these formations? What's gonna be there? Which I found, not only is it really fun for um, single player for for two player, it's really fun for solo too. And we can guess we can see you know a ton of different stuff for all the different uh, regiments, battalions that are in the game here. And then we have another pile. So this is a big thing. Again, it's, you know, six hundred counters, lots of different stuff going on here too. Here's the West German ones. Uh, kind of go through and they, they're all looking similar so I won't you know, kind of spend too much time but I did want to call attention to the fact that this is a big deck now of course you're going to be using a fraction of these in any scenario you know a smaller scenario might have seven eight nine of these a mid-sized scenario might have I'm going to guess about 15 or so so it's going to be you know pretty small it's not going to be that big it just depends on what units and battalions and regiments you've got going in the in the game here but so that's a little bit on those cards and how they work in that mechanic in the game we're down to our last thing which is the maps so let's talk a little bit about the maps there are eight of them 
And as we've seen, I've seen with other lock and load publishing games, uh, each of the two maps here are identical. So if we can look at this is map one, it's the identical same geographic features, except one is the uh, uh, snow terrain and one is the uh, you know green terrain here, the regular terrain without snow. So if we look at these, get a pretty good idea on what they go. These are all geomorphic, so you can kind of create uh, various formations to your heart's content. I should also mention too, each one of these hexes is an inch across and the units and counters that we looked at are three quarters of an inch. And the stacking system, you know, it's always curious what, the, what, what kind of stacking modules there would be in this. Um, I feel like it's a very, man, it's, it's two units. Now there could be headquarters and support weapons and some other things in there that's gonna go above two units, but it's generally two platoons in each hex. And that's a hard limit that's enforced throughout the turn. So you, you know, as you're moving, you're going to have to move around stuff and things like that. You can't just kind of have units pile through to other things like that. So I feel like that's going to make for a very playable system. You're not going to have monster stacks on the board, which is always something that I wonder about. So again, here we've got a hilly kind of rural terrain here with some towns there. And again, these are all single-sided, so just printed on one side. If we look here now, we can see the same map, except this is the snow version of them. So again, you're gonna get four different geographical, four different geographic tiles, uh, and each one is gonna have two uh, kind of climate sets for it or weather sets for it there. So the same thing, the hills and some of the towns there. Let's take a look at uh, some of these other ones here. This is map two. So we get the same thing in the, the green version here. So again, a lot of rural uh, kind of terrain here. There is one that has a lot of dense kind of a, a larger town or small city perhaps here, but again, we've got a nice big hill dominating the feature with some woods in there, rough terrain, forests, roads, and things like that that are going in play here. A lot of open spaces over here on the, the left side of this one. Then, this is the snow version. I'll skip the snow version for that one. Let's go to map three to take a look at this one. All right, so again, some more open spaces up here, rivers. There's a bridging system here too. Uh, there are fords in the game as well at certain places that can get added via a counter here. A town over here on this side, we've got some fields and things. There is blocking terrain and then there's also obscuring terrain, which tends to be, you know, have seen that in the lock and load, uh, the heroes system they have as well, the tactical system there. This is three with the snow one. I'll hop over that one. And then we, we hop over a little bit. We go one, two, three, 45. I'm not sure why uh, that does that, but um, we skip 40 something maps to get to 45. This is the one that's got the, the large urban formation here. It's like a big glob of town and stuff like that. I mean, house to house combat and fighting over here with a, a hill on the outside, a couple of hills up here. Yeah, so a lot of cool stuff. Lake in the middle. I feel like this is going to be a really fun one to play on. Let's take a look at the snow version of that one. Same thing. So this one, you can really see where the towns are for this one too and stand out. So um, each one of these maps is uh, 13 by 19, roughly across. So 13 this way and 19 this way. Um, and so uh, again, you can kind of do the math putting four of these together. But I feel like, you know, you can get a lot of gameplay on one map and two maps, four maps, of course, isn't going to take up a, a huge amount of table space. Although some of those player aids that you'll set beside it will grab up some space as well. But it shouldn't be a game that has an overwhelming footprint as you play it. Lastly, we have our dice, because again, you're going to be chucking dice, you know, you're going to get firepower dice rolling for your shots, and then the defense rolls for dice too for its armor, and you get uh, a lot of different action in there that way. And there we go, a look at Storming the Gap, World at War 85, Volume 1. Yeah. I'm going to come back in a couple days or so and take a look at the expansion pack for this. And then I hope to take a look at Blood and Fury in the near future as well. And then once we've done kind of first looks at all of these, I want to show some gameplay, probably from Blood and Fury um, or and or Storming the Gap as we go forward. So I really want to bring a scenario of this uh, to the channel to take a look at gameplay um, in, in that. So thanks so much for watching. If you've got questions, I'd be happy to answer them. If you played the system, I'd be curious to hear how you like it. Um, and again, thanks for watching. I'll put links to the next videos up here as they come ready. Thanks for watching, everybody. Have a great day.